It's Thursday, the 25th of February. Hoping for full marks, the government unveils plans for teacher assessments to replace GCSE and A-level exams this year. The critics warn they'll lead to grade inflation. Bumps in the roadmap, Sky News goes inside Warrington Hospital where staff are concerned about rising winter pressures. The roadmap comes with, with good news and kind of makes us all very bit anxious and a bit nervous as well. Purely an accident, police say there's no evidence Tiger Woods was impaired by drink or drugs at the time of the crash that left him seriously injured. Acting irresponsibly, an NHS England boss criticises Gwyneth Paltrow over her unusual methods of combating long COVID. And there will be drier, brighter, calmer conditions for the rest of this week. Still a little bit of rain in the forecast, so I'll have all the details for you later in the programme. Good morning. Well, after last summer's chaos caused by an algorithm to produce exam results, it was very much a case of must do better for the government. With A-levels and GCSEs cancelled this year, students will instead be graded by their teachers. There will be optional test papers and exam results will come earlier than usual to allow more time for appeals. But there are concerns that allowing schools to award grades could lead to grade inflation. Our education correspondent Laura Bundock reports. How to replace exams fairly? That's the question. And now we know the government's answer. This year, the grades will be given by teachers. With so much missed learning, it's still a stressful time for students. I'm quite concerned about how my teachers will assess my grades because some teachers I didn't have last year. Um, so I feel like their opinion on me might be different. The idea of doing exams was much too overwhelming after we'd missed so much school and I was already so demotivated. I just don't think that personally I could have sat an exam and got the grade that I deserved. I think because there's no algorithm, it'll be definitely better. I myself feel that I trust my teachers. I've worked closely with them over the last two years and I've tried my best in exams. That algorithm caused chaos last summer leaving many students downgraded, even missing places at university. It was eventually ditched, but the damage had already been done. Here's what's happening this year. Teachers will submit grades to exam boards by June the 18th. Students then find out results from the 9th of August. That's two weeks earlier than normal and provides a period for students to appeal. Ministers say their plan offers fairness and flexibility. The problem last year was the system wasn't fair and it led to a last minute U-turn. Both of these things added huge stress and anxiety to students and that's something everyone wants to avoid this time. The head teacher in this North London school welcomes trust being given to teachers. Because we know our students, we can look at what evidence we need to give them the best possible grade, to give them the best possible chance. I think it overall, I think it will work well for teachers and it will work well for young people. But there are still significant concerns about the lack of detail. Unions question the reliability and consistency of grades if schools use different methods. They think the government's made a serious error of judgment. And others fear there remains a risk of excessive grade inflation, which could devalue the credibility of this year's results. Laura Bundock, Sky News. Well, I'm joined now by the school's minister, Nick Gibb. Uh, so a big day for students. They finally got an answer. They've waited seven weeks after being told their exams were cancelled. Um, so how's this going to work? Well, the teacher will be the will devise the grade. It's teacher assessed grades. Uh, sh the, the teacher will look at a array, a range of evidence of the students' work uh, over the, the last two years. Uh, there'll be quality assurance processes in place in the school. The grades will be signed off by the head teacher. They'll be submitted to the uh, exam boards on the 18th of June. Uh, there'll be quality assurance processes in place by the exam boards. They'll have a uh, a sample of schools that go and check those grades to make sure there is the evidence that supports them. Uh, and there'll be a risk-based uh, sampling as well. Uh, and the results will be announced on August the 10th for A-levels and August the 12th 
uh, for GCSEs and their, and their equivalents. And there'll be a very robust uh, appeal process for those students that are not happy with their grades. But we, uh, that given that students will know the, the type of evidence that the teacher will be using uh, on which to base their grade, uh, any, we hope that any uh, pr problems will have been resolved at a school level uh, a long time before uh, the grades are submitted. Mm. Let, let me read you a quote. Uh, by doing away with all moderation, it would be misguided and create deep inequalities. Without moderation, there would be grade inflation of 12 pe percentage points at A star and A, casting doubt on the validity of the grades in the eyes of employers and university. That was yourself a year ago saying exactly that, that this new system would lead to great inequalities. Well, we do think that exams are the fairest system and we were determined to keep exams. But when it became very clear in January that we were restricting access to schools to all but the vulnerable children and ch children of critical workers, given the disruption that students had faced over the year, uh, the, the only fair system was to move away from exam this year uh, to a teacher assessed system. And we have built in very protective measures. We, we trust the judgment of professionals who run our schools. Uh, but on top of that, we have these quality assurance processes to make sure that there is a process at the school level uh, to ensure that the, the grades are a fair reflection of the attainment of the students. And then there's that other quality assurance by the exam boards. There's also very detailed guidance that uh, will be produced by the exam boards and detailed training for teachers in how to submit those exams. So there's a whole raft of measures to make sure that uh, the grades are a, are a fair reflection of the work and the ability of students. But, but if you're saying that exams are the best thing, are you, are you basically saying that this plan is the best of a bad bunch? I'm saying it's the best we can do other than exams. And exams this year so uh, wouldn't be fair because of the different levels of disruption that students have faced across the country. So this is the best system. And we trust the professionalism of teachers and head teachers. We consulted very widely uh, on the 15th of January for two weeks on the basis of these details. And, and 100,000 responses, half of whom were, were students, uh, the, the, these, this method has achieved uh, widespread support in the sector, including from the, the heads of some of the big unions, Jeff Barton and so on, uh, has, uh, has been very supportive of these measures. We've worked very closely uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the schools, with the regulator, with the exam boards, um, uh, to make sure that we, we put together the best possible method of ensuring fairness and to ensure that students can move on to the next phase of their life. We don't want any student to suffer long-term damage to their prospects as a consequence of this pandemic. But you're, but you're saying it, it is essentially a compromise. It's not what you would like to do. You're putting all your faith in the hands of the teachers, but you didn't want to do that last year. I wonder what's changed. You know, have you suddenly had a revelation that teachers are, are quite capable of, of monitoring their own pupils? Well, we put in place, as I said, these quality assurance processes and with very detailed guidance from examples to make you're sure... Teachers, sorry to interrupt, but you're essentially asking okay. teachers not only to, to judge their pupils, but you're asking them to judge their pupils against other schools and against the rest of the country. How on earth can, can teachers be expected to do that? Well, teachers are very experienced and they will know from, from, from previous years uh, what the standard that a particular student has reached, given the disruption that they have faced. They will only look at uh, the work uh, where that element of the curriculum has actually been taught. There are those quality assurance processes in place at the school level, and there'll be very detailed guidance from examples about how to judge that, uh, how to judge students and how to create that, that range of evidence to support the grades it that have been seems, it, it seems like last year you were saying we can't trust the teachers it must be an exam uh, and, and teachers words were totally ignored when it came to saying look this this pupil is perfectly capable of getting this grade and and you've awarded them a much lower grade and now it seems you're, you're saying right teachers are going to have all the responsibility and, and quite frankly if, if it gets messed up this year we can blame them no look you know you, one learns from uh, what happened in, in pre in last year uh, and we've worked very closely for many months uh, on even even when the schools were open and we were expecting exams to go ahead. We were working on a contingency in case we had to cancel exams because of further disruption uh, to children's education. We've worked closely with the exam boards. We've worked closely with the school sector, with teachers, head teachers. Every step of the way, we've consulted uh, to make sure that we can we can devise a system that's as fair as possible for students. They can move on to the next stage of their lives. But it, but you're right. Of course, exams 
are the fairest and best system of judging attainment. But we can't have exams this year because of the pandemic and because of the, the disruption that many students have faced up and down the country. It wouldn't be fair to hold exams this year. And we trust professional teachers are the people that know their students best. And we do trust their professionalism. Uh, and we but, can but make sure that students are saying get that. that Mm. But, but academics are questioning this system. Natalie Pereira from the Education Policy Institute says there's a really high risk. We'll see inconsistencies in the grades among different pupils and schools and a significant risk that schools will take very different approaches to grading. It could result in larger numbers of pupils appealing their grades or extremely high grade inflation. It's going to lead to chaos in the summer again, isn't it? No, um, look, all these risks that uh, the EPI are talking about and are all risks we're all fully aware of, of course. This is not the ideal situation to be in. This is a consequence of the pandemic, but it is the fairest system given the different levels of disruption students have faced. And of course, we are aware of all those issues uh, that think tanks and other have been people... have let down over the last, the last year repeatedly. And, and you're now telling them, well, look, you've got to go through, jump through these hoops. It's not ideal, but it's the best we can come up with. And it's taken us seven weeks to come up with it. Well, we were working on this before uh, Christmas. Uh, we were able, once schools were... Uh, announced that schools were not going to be open to most students on the 4th of January. We were ready to consult with the details of this on the 15th of January. So we, we've been very uh, pre prepared, for been working on this for many months. It is, the, it is the ferry system. We want to make sure that students continue to study. So the exam grades won't be submitted until the 18th of June. That gives more months uh, of face-to-face of -face teaching as schools are going back on the 8th of March. Uh, we want to do everything we can to help students deal with the consequences of this pandemic. The pandemic it has caused all kinds of disruption to children's education. That's what's driven this. And what we're doing as a government is trying to make up for that by A, the, all the measures we announced yesterday about uh, the catch-up, uh, the, the recovery premium, and that builds on all the catch-up funding, the billion pounds that we announced earlier this year and, and the one-to-one -one tuition and so on. We want to make sure that no pupil, no student, suffers long-term damage to their prospects as a consequence of this pandemic. And one of the things we need to do is to make sure uh, that they get grades, they get their qualifications this year, so they can move on to college, to university, to an apprenticeship, uh, and not have that process, that uh, progress disrupted by this pandemic. And that's what this uh, system does. It's the fairest system that we could devise, working We've worked very closely with teachers and with the education sector in devising it. It's had widespread support when we consulted, including 50,000 students who've responded well, to the consultation. What about John Coles from Ofqual? I don't know if you've heard, but there are reports uh, this mm -hmm. morning that he has resigned. Uh, can you confirm that? Well, he resigned uh, a little while ago when uh, one of the committees that he was on was going to be uh, was no longer needed. Look, I respect Sir John Coles very much indeed. He runs an, uh, an effective multi-academy trust. And let, he let has his quote views. To you. He, he said the government's views. desperate I, I not to be... It, a, yes. yeah, our, our viewers might not, though. The, the, the government's desperate okay. not to be accused of having an algorithm or exams by the back door, uh, focusing on this rather than the actual goal. How are we going to be fair to young people? We risk an outcome in August much worse than last year. What do you make of that? So he, so he thought that the exam materials that we're, that we're making available to teachers, the, the question bank that they can use as part of the, uh, the range of evidence that they'll need to supply to exam boards about how they've devised the grade, he wanted that to be compulsory, mandatory. We asked that question in the consultation, should, should those materials, uh, should they be an option for teachers or should they be mandatory? And the consultation was very clear that they should be an option and not mandatory. We didn't want uh, those materials to be regarded as uh, a mini exam because you know we've cancelled exams this year because they were felt to be unfair uh, given the disruption. So we didn't want to then cancel exams and replace them with another exam. But that you know John is in, entitled to his views, but the majority of people in the sector, including the heads of the major unions such as ASCL, uh, believe that we have devised the best possible. Uh, method given the circumstances. It's fair. Okay. Uh, there are quality assurances and checks to make sure that those grades do reflect the work of the students. There'll be a okay. robust appeal process. And we've got an autumn season series uh, in case students are not happy they can take the exams in the autumn if they wish to do so. You mentioned the summer schools. Who, who, who are going to run these? Because the teachers, as well as now having to learn a whole new system and, and mark all these exam papers, have been teaching some students at school, some online. They are, quite frankly, knackered. Who, who on earth is going to run these summer schools? 
Well, we want them run from the schools, um, and, but, but there's, the reason why there's funding is to enable the schools to be able to employ people to run, to take part and run those who, summer schools. We want a who, summer of activity. Who is, who is qualified to teach our youngsters apart from teachers? Well, there are, there are a whole raft of people uh, that will be able to come in, young graduates, teacher, people who are training to be teachers, retired teachers. Uh, that is a matter for the school to decide, but we are providing uh, to 200 million pounds to enable schools to run those summer schools. And that's on top of all the other measures. Uh, the billion pounds we've distributed to schools uh, to provide catch up the, 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 the national tutoring program, 33 tutoring very, very briefly, companies. We only have a few seconds left, but how, how are you okay. going to ensure that the right people, the right children get this? And it's not just the parents with the sharpest elbows, that it's actually the children who've missed out uh, who actually get this help. Now we're giving guidance to schools to focus uh, th these resources to, to students, the most disadvantaged students who have suffered the most during the pandemic to help them to catch up. There's a whole raft of measures, as I've said, the National Tutoring Programme, the Academic Mentors, the, pu the, the premiums that we've given to schools to help to fund this. We've also appointed Sir Kevin Collins to look at for the slightly longer term, but how we can ensure that students that need, you know, that need to catch up over a period of months and years that we have measures in place for those students as well and we'll be we'll be listening to what sir kevin has to say about how we can do that we are determined that no student will suffer uh, that long-term damage to their prospects as a consequence of this pandemic and we're backing that determination with 1.7 billion pounds over this period to make sure that uh, that every student will be able to catch up and today's announcement about how we're going to make sure every young person has their qualification despite the fact we've had to cancel exams it's okay. a fair system, and it does mean they'll be able to go on to the next phase of their, of their career. Nick Gibb, we're going to have to leave you there. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. Well, let's bring in now our political correspondent, Rob Powell, who is here with us. Um, Rob, so, so really an acknowledgement from him that it's, it's not the best system in the world. It's, it's kind of the best they can come up with for this year. Yeah, I think the government is in a very tricky position here, and whatever they came up with... I think there would be, it wouldn't be perfect and there would be downsides to it. I think the worry with the system that's come up with, which focuses very heavily on teacher assessed grades rather than any process of standardisation, I think the worry will be that they've yo-yoed from one position last year of using this algorithm to try and standardise grades across the country and get consistency. Uh, and they've gone to the other extreme. And whilst they may have solved some of the problems caused by that algorithm, they may have created other problems because teachers, even with uh, their grades being standardised within the school, will inevitably judge progress differently to other schools. So how, how do you compare one pupil from one school to another pupil from uh, another school if you don't have some system there? Now, Nick Gibb there saying that there would be robust quality assurance processes, um, as he put it. I think we will have to see more detail of how robust those processes are going, is go are going to be. Also interesting, I think, confirming that Sir John Coles, who sat on a board at Ofqual, Ofqual the exam regulator, did resign because he felt that some exam materials that are being made optional for teachers to use their assessments, he felt that they should have been mandatory to get some kind of whole country standardisation. The government chose not to do that, and as a result, he stepped down. Rob, thanks very much. Well, moving away from education, more evidence that the pandemic is causing fewer people to come forward to get cancer systems symptoms checked. We're going to speak to two patients at half past eight. Also more on the government's new plan for assessing pupils just after half past seven. We are going to speak to a former chief examiner and a current A-level student. And later in the programme, I'm going to be speaking to a North Yorkshire surfer who's been reunited with his beloved board that was picked up 400 miles away in the Shetland Islands. Now, the crisis in hospitals is not over yet. That's the warning from doctors facing a new wave of patients, which is putting the NHS under renewed strain. The announcement of the roadmap for lifting the lockdown has coincided with an increase in people going to hospital, some with COVID, but many now with complaints usually associated with the winter season. Our health correspondent, Ashish Joshi, reports. So we've got four ambulances on the way in now. So there's two inbound and two expected, and one's just arrived. They weathered the first and the second wave. Now, they're bracing themselves for the cold wave. Seasonal winter pressure. It's late, but it's here. I think 
Where we are now, um, February going into March, this would probably have come a little bit earlier. We're starting to see what we would say is our winter pressures the last week or two, rather than it start in January. So I think it's a little bit later, and I think the next couple of weeks are going to be very challenging. The news of the roadmap comes with, with good news and kind of makes us all very bit anxious and a bit nervous as well. It's a triple whammy, winter. Sick patients who have stayed away from hospital are now seeking treatment, and there's still a pandemic. Hi, Debbie. Hi. Debbie Fairbrother was rushed to hospital by ambulance after she fainted at work. Her daily blackout started after she caught COVID-19 five weeks ago. What happened to you? Uh, as far as I know, I just collapsed. Um, don't remember anything, don't, don't actually remember it um, coming on or anything like that. No warning this morning. Um, don't remember much, to be honest. I just remember waking up and then getting in the ambulance. The hospital is seeing a sharp spike in emergency attendances. We've been here for nearly 48 hours and at least 392 patients have attended A&D in that time. That's comparable to the busiest winter. We've been filming here for about 10 minutes and in that time, about four ambulances have arrived. Now that just gives you an idea of just how much pressure there is still on hospitals like this one. The hospital's intensive care unit is still full of very sick COVID-19 patients. But thankfully, there are fewer now than during the peak of the second wave. I think at some point, lockdown has got to be eased. You know, the, the government's in an impossible situation. When, when do you do it? Numbers are certainly dropping. The pressure is certainly easing on the NHS and we're starting to see more of the normal winter pressure. We wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't another, another surge, another wave. Hospitals across the country must manage winter pressures at the same time as COVID-19. Infection control, hot and cold zones and patient flows. New ways of working must be found. Bed, cardiac monitoring, everything's in there. Dr Patel showed me the new pods where he can treat and still protect vulnerable patients. This area has been remodelled to take pressure off its emergency department. I'm noticing the normal COPD asthma patients coming through the door now um, that we perhaps didn't do a little while ago. Um, and that presents another challenge because we need to protect those that have come in with frail lung conditions from any other patients that may have COVID within the hospital. So it's about creating areas like this to, like you say, may mean that we've got a place to move them out of A&E as quickly as possible. It's right to look forward to the summer. The vaccines and falling infection rates give us hope. But it's also wrong to think this emergency is over. Ashish Joshi, Sky News at Warrington Hospital. Time for a look at the morning's other main stories now. And Facebook says it's banned the Myanmar military from using its Facebook and Instagram platforms as pro-democracy demonstrators continue to protest the military coup. The army seized power earlier this month, making unsubstantiated claims of fraud in last November's election, which was won by Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy. Sky News has been recognised with six awards at this year's Royal Television Society Journalism Awards, including News Channel of the Year. The channel also scooped Best Home and International Coverage for its reporting of the pandemic, both here and in Europe and in Italy's epicentre in Bergamo, Nick Martin was Jane's specialist journalist of the year for revealing the human cost of coronavirus in care homes. And the Outstanding Contribution Award went to the head of Sky News, John Riley. The actress Gwyneth Paltrow says she is suffering from long COVID, which left her with fatigue and brain fog but her methods to tackle the syndrome have been criticised by the National Medical Director for NHS England, Professor Stephen Powers. Uh, well, let's bring in Hanisha Sethi, who has more for us. Uh, please tell us this doesn't involve candles, Hanisha. 
Well, Gwyneth Paltrow is known for her health hacks, whether that's beasting facials or goat milk cleanses. She loves sharing her health hacks online. Now, like many other celebrities that caught COVID, she's been suffering from long COVID symptoms, including brain fog, like you just mentioned, and she's been sharing some of her remedies online. Now, these include drinking herbal non-alcoholic cocktails, using an infrared sauna, which is just a modern type of sauna for you and I, and she's also keen on using a keto and plant-based diet which involves fasting up until 11 a.m. every day. Now, Gwyneth Paltrow on her own Instagram account has a large following of 7.4 million followers. So her reach is huge and this is kind of where the problem lies because being in the public eye and having a huge following people are quick to criticize especially when it comes to public health issues now this is where the nhs has stepped in because professor stephen powis has said that serious science should be applied like the virus misinformation carries across borders and he goes on to say that some of the solutions that she's recommending are not solutions we would recommend in the nhs and he goes on to wish her well but there is a wider issue here which is collective responsibility not just for individuals but celebrities alike anisha thank you very much well let's get a look at the weather now naz i'm not going to ask you about your alternative remedies but how is the weather going to be treating us throughout the rest of the day my alternative remedy, Jane, is plenty of sunshine, and that's what we're looking at for today. Sunny skies for most places, but there is a little bit of rain in the forecast too. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Good morning. We're looking at mostly fine and settled conditions across a vast majority of the UK and Ireland for today. And for the rest of the week, it's going to become much drier and calmer. There is still a bit of wet weather around, though, for today. In fact, this morning, across many central, southern and eastern parts of uh, England, we are seeing cloudy skies this morning, some patchy outbreaks of rain. The rest of England and Wales, mainly dry and sunny and plenty of sunshine elsewhere, in fact. But it is a bit of a cooler and fresher start to the day compared to recently, with the frost in some rural spots. And there are blustery showers across the northwest of Scotland. Showers will continue across Scotland through this afternoon, becoming more widespread across the north there, then eventually easing a bit. A few showers across Ireland and Northern Ireland, mainly dry for England and Wales, but East Anglia and South East cloudy and damp. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Thanks, Naz. Still to come on Sky News Breakfast, we're going to be getting more on the government's new plans for GCSE and A-levels this year. We'll speak to a former chief examiner and a current A-level student. all kinds of treasures that um, the Darwin children collected. So there is, for example, a, a silk handkerchief that belonged to Charles Darwin, um, letters, lots of locks of family hair, and um, little pencils, carved animals, and most significantly, this collection of shells, um, many of which were collected by Charles Darwin on the Beagle voyage. Well, Charles Darwin um, travelled around the world on HMS Beagle between 1831 and 1836. And the point of the voyage was to map areas of land and sea that had not previously been um, recorded. And it was a very formative time for Charles Darwin. The observations that he made on the Beagle voyage ultimately went on to um, allow him to develop his theory of evolution. He collected many specimens on the Beagle Voyage, um, which all fed into his work on evolution that he developed at Downhouse. And so the, this little collection of shells really um, 
highlight some of the things that he was he was looking for on the voyage, some of the things that he brought back. But I think it's just really wonderful that he then gave those to his daughters for their little shell collection. I don't think there can be many Victorian children who could have claimed to have had shells from the South Pacific in their keepsake box. As we examine the story beyond the headline. For the knowledge seekers. Welcome to Divided States. For the straight talkers, the curious, and the ones who want to be entertained. Backstage Sky News' entertainment podcast. For wherever you are. Welcome to Sophie Ridge on Sunday podcast. For the ones who want to know more. Welcome to the All Out Politics podcast. For the listeners. From Sky News Storycast. Sky News Podcasts. Listen and subscribe for free. Let's stay with our top story this morning. The school's minister, Nick Gibb, says that the plan to replace A-level and GCSE exams with teacher-assessed grades this year is the fairest system possible, saying that the government has learned from last summer's controversy when an algorithm downgraded the results of thousands of students. Here's what he told us a little earlier this hour. One learns from uh, what happened in, in pre uh, last year, uh, and we've worked very closely for many months uh, on, even, even when the schools were open and we were expecting exams to go ahead, we were working on a contingency in case we had to cancel exams because of further disruption uh, to children's education. We've worked closely with the exam boards, we've worked closely with the school sector, with teachers, head teachers. Every step of the way we've consulted uh, to make sure that, that we, can, we can devise a system that's as fair as possible for students. They can move on to the next stage of their lives. But, it, but you're right, of course, exams are the fairest and best system of judging attainment. But we can't have exams this year because of the pandemic and because of the, the disruption that many students have faced up and down the country. It wouldn't be fair to hold exams this year. And we trust professional teachers are the people that know their students best. And we do trust their professionalism. Well, let's get more on how these government plans for teacher assessments will be used in place of GCSE and A-levels this year. Uh, I'm joined by John Neal, a former chief examiner for the exam board AQA. Um, lovely to talk to you, John. What, what are your initial thoughts about the plans? <coughs> I think the government are just washing the hands of the whole thing, just putting it in the hands of teachers and expecting the teachers with no training to get on with this and accept, they'll take all the flack from parents. And it's the parents, what I call the geography parents, the ones with the peninsula units and the islands and the granite outcrops in the kitchens, they'll be the ones who'll be pushing for higher grades. It's the ones, the students who were, out, who were going to get the levels one to three, they're going to be the ones who are going to suffer. I had a meeting, I was part of a meeting with some other educationists on May the 12th last year, where we offered Ofqual via a Teams meeting, we offered Ofqual a system, a, con um, a continuous assessment system that included examinations that enabled teachers to gather evidence, to keep that evidence, to have criterion referenced work to back up a grade. We offered that to Ofqual nearly a year ago. We're still waiting for a response. Mm. I mean, this isn't the first day backlash. There was one in 2012 as well. This has been going on for years. I disagree with Nick Gibb. Exams are not the fairest means of assessment. He did say that, that teachers will be looking at how the, the pupils have, have performed over the year and that there will be a form of comparison, that, that uh, the exam boards will be going into some schools to try and make sure that they are fair. I mean, do you, it isn't an ideal system, clearly. He acknowledged as much. But do you think it, it is perhaps fairer than, than making them sit full-blown exams? Absolutely. The, the, the exams are not going to happen. But there has to be, and there's been a chance, there's been a year of this going on, there's been an opportunity to involve Year 11 students, Year 10 students, and say, look, we need a portfolio of evidence. Everybody's 
portfolio has got to be the same. How are you going to compare one portfolio of evidence from one school with another portfolio of evidence from another school? Some students have gone feral. They haven't been in school. They haven't got that work to, to compare. How are you going to give a grade to someone who hasn't got that work? If everybody had the same system, if there was a, an online system, a way of recording work, students' work from the age of 11 all the way through till they're 16, because in the real world, students don't always perform best on one particular day when they're 16. Sometimes they do it when they're 12 or 13. Catch that, catch that success, catch that work, store it, use it against criteria and say, this student can do this. Let's see where we can get them. Let's not stop at GCSE when they're 16. Let's go to undergraduate level at 16. Let's make, let's make this an opportunity to do something about the educational system. At the moment, it's not working. The teachers, the schools are the ones who are going to be taking this in the neck without any help from the government at all. So, so do you feel that the system that has been proposed for this year, I mean, we could talk endlessly about the, the, the catastrophe of last year, but do you think the system for this year is going to increase inequalities between those who perhaps have, have the least resources in society, the least backup at home, and those, as you say, the, the geography parents with the granite worktops? Yes, absolutely, yes. They're the ones who are gonna suffer, but all students are gonna suffer. The last people we want to, to, suffer, to suffer in this are the students. They're the ones who've gone through this. They've missed out on social life, they've missed out on education, um, attainment, achievement, mixing with friends, they've missed out on all of these things. And it's the ones who were the levels one to three, that 30%, the rump of the educated, the, one, the, the kids that you love, they're the ones who are gonna suffer. They're the ones who are gonna lose out in this situation. And they're the ones who have got very different things to offer society that we absolutely need. John Neild, uh, former chief examiner, interesting to talk to you, thank you. Uh, let's talk now to a student, uh, Charlie Knott who is an A-level student and is joining us now. Hi, Charlie. Um, what are your thoughts about what you've heard from the government about what they are proposing for this summer for you? I mean, it's interesting because it probably won't come as a surprise to anyone, but we've been very confused and a little frustrated for quite a while now. But I think the thing I want to get across about what's just come out is that they've, we're still confused, but just in a different way now because we're not sure whether the way that our grades are going to be determined is fair or not. Because I think the main, the worry and the underlying problem of the new system is that it's not representative of comparing two people in different parts of the country. And the teachers are only going to have the data to compare two people in the same school. So you could have someone that outperforms 70% of the country, but because they're one of the worst in their class, will be given a lower grade than they would have done in an actual exam. I think that's what's going to worry people the most is whether their teachers will have enough evidence to go on or like good enough representation of how hard they've worked to give them a grade which represents their ability. I mean, would you have preferred exams or do you think exams would have been a, a, a pretty challenging this year given what you've gone through? I think I probably don't speak for everyone when I say this. For me personally, I would have preferred exams, but only because that probably would have given me an advantage. I can see that because of the lack of resources that some people will have, sitting an exam this year would have been unbelievably unfair. But I do think what we need from exam boards, which I think they may be offering schools, is some sort of standardized material that they can assess students on, because they have to have a way of comparing students between schools. Otherwise, if you're an employer or a university looking to admit a student and they have an A, you don't know whether that's them being better than most of the country or them being better than most of their college. And that means that any A level given, any grade given from 2021 is just going to be seen as a terrible representation of a student's ability. Charlie, what are you studying? What are you hoping to do? And, and what have the last couple of years been like for you? I'm studying physics, maths and economics, and I'm hoping to go on to do engineering. Um, so I've got some quite challenging offers. It's important to me that I do really well. And again, I, I think that the best thing for me would just to be tested on the stuff I've learned because I feel confident with it. I think if I was tested, I would do better 
often if my teachers just let me do my thing. And I think there'll be a lot of students in the country, a bit like me, who like to sort of just, you know, pull out the bag at the last minute. And there is going to be a big worry. That's a perfectly fine thing to do when it comes to A-level exams. People do it every year. You do a whole load of revision just before you go ahead, do well in the exam, and you get the results you need. If you think about it this year, for every, for quite a significant chunk of people that will be doing that, it's going to go horribly wrong for them because they haven't been doing that well all year, and they'll be even a much lower grade than they deserve if they had put the work in. I mean, you're, you're obviously pretty diligent, but how, how hard has it been to stay focused? Oh, I mean, it's, it's not easy. We have two-hour lessons with, you know, upwards of 200 people in them. And if you think about it, you have one teacher, which, you know, I can sympathise for the teachers. That must be a nightmare for them too, but it is hard. If you're asking a question, if several people are asking questions at once, just like in a little chat box down the side, it's, it's hard to get instant feedback. It's also hard with marking because marking online is a pain because we have to scan all our work in and they can't just write on the paper. It makes it really hard, uh, which means that quite a lot of the marking we're having to do ourselves, which means it's a lot harder to get feedback on your work. Well, Charlie, don't despair. All of that work you've done, it will have gone into the grey matter. It will be useful in the long run, even if you're not being tested on it. Uh, well done and thanks so much for talking to us this morning on Sky. Now, police say the car crash which injured Tiger Woods was purely an accident with no evidence that the golf star was impaired by drugs or alcohol. He's recovering in hospital after surgery on serious injuries to his right leg. The first officer on the scene said the 45-year-old was not aware how badly injured he was. From Los Angeles, Sally Lockwood reports. Those who pulled Tiger Woods from this crash say he's lucky to be alive. But it's unclear if his injuries could force an end to the golfer's sporting career. Police are calling this an accident, not a crime. The first officer to arrive at the scene found no evidence the golfer was intoxicated or impaired, but says Woods appeared unaware of the gravity of his condition. I asked him, you know, hey, can you tell me your first name? Um, he looked at me and he said, Tiger. And it took me a half second uh, but it, I saw his face and I, and I thought, oh yeah, you're Tiger Woods. I don't think he was aware of how gravely he was injured at the time. Tiger Woods was rescued through the windscreen, the exterior of the SUV severely battered after it rolled several times. The protected interior and seat belt is credited with saving the golfer's life. This section of road is said to be notorious for accidents and Tiger Woods, it's understood, was driving downhill at speed when his SUV lost control. His injuries were said to be so serious, no impairment tests were done at the scene as he was rushed to a trauma center for emergency surgery. We've learned a metal rod has been put in the golfer's injured right leg and screws and pins are reinforcing his ankle and foot. Now in recovery, the long-term impact of these injuries are still unknown. The muscles, they have to get strong. We have to work on coordination. So he has, he's in a machine that's a finely tuned machine. And so it's the muscles and the rotation of the body parts and the creation of momentum. These are all the things that allow him to do what he does. So that's going to take a much longer time than just the six to eight weeks for the bones to heal. Tiger Woods come back from rock bottom with a Masters win in 2019 has been described as something from a film. Many don't want this crash to be the scene that ends his sporting career. Without Tiger Woods out there, I think something would be lacking. I think that most golfers after a couple of back surgeries would have said, you know what, I'm done with this. I can't do it anymore. But yet he's got four of them and then now he's got this latest setback with this accident. If there's any individual in the world that can come back from this, it's certainly Tiger. It's unclear how long the golfer will remain in hospital or if he'll ever play again. But one thing many know is a comeback should never be discounted for Tiger Woods. Sally Lockwood, Sky News, Los Angeles. Still to come on Sky News Breakfast, I'm going to be speaking to the shadow communities and local government secretary, Steve Reid, about how Labour plans to secure the future of Britain's post-pandemic high streets. I'm Diana Magne and I'm Sky's Russia correspondent, based here in Moscow. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world.
the first move and they've gone and found you again. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. There are hundreds of these turbines, but thousands more across Gansu. That's what's left of the North Tunnel, uh, where the North Koreans exploded five nuclear warheads. And this is a show of strength at a time when China is more fragile than it has been at any time in recent years. Shrapnel from that explosion, so you can see it littered along all the way. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. The train station and the airport, they're both closed. We're not sure about the roads. We've seen reports that they are being blocked by police, so we're going to try and find a way out of Wuhan. After five days stranded here, this is Deliverance. We help you understand the world with us. Tom Cheshire, Sky News, Beijing. The Labour Party is unveiling plans for how it says it would secure the future of Britain's high streets after the pandemic. Among proposals are reversing new planning rules by, introduced by the Conservatives and also giving councils new power to repurpose commercial properties that have been vacant for at least 12 months. Well, I'm joined now by Steve Reid, who's the Shadow Communities and Local Government Secretary. Um, Steve, we, we will very much come on to High Street um, and uh, what, what you're hoping from the budget. But, but first, let's just quickly get your thoughts on the, on the big story of the day exams. Uh, we are now at least being given some certainty for pupils. Do you welcome today's announcement by the government? Yes, on exams, it's you know, after the chaos that we saw last year with the algorithm... Um, you know, I'm, we're really glad that the government has decided not to go back to that. I, I went and visited, you know, several groups of students at their schools last year, and they were absolutely terrified about their future prospects after the algorithm downgraded the results that everybody expected them to get. Many of them have lost their university places. So, yes, it's welcome that we'll be seeing teachers given a much bigger say this time. But we do want to make sure there are measures in place to ensure that there's consistency across the whole piece and that there will be a, a system for reviewing and checking to make sure that the grades being awarded to students are the right grades. Uh, for students who, who aren't being tested or, or examined at the end of this term, uh, for those going on, there are going to be summer schools to help them catch up. Uh, do you think the teaching unions will, will oppose teachers getting involved with this? No, of course they won't, because, you know, teachers have already been going way beyond the extra mile to, to help helps students in schools up and down the country over this past year. It, I mean, and, and the additional funding the government's announced is welcome, of course. We've got a whole generation here that's missed out on their education. It's going to take much more, frankly, than one summer to, to help them to catch up. So the additional funding is welcome. But if you really look at how much is being put in, it, it works out at only 43p per pupil per day. And it's going to take a lot more than that to see a whole generation of students catch up. So while this is a, a good start, it, it's nowhere near enough. We really need a, ma a major national program running over several years to ensure that an entire generation of young people can catch up with the education that will really mark whether they can or can't make the most of their futures. And we should see this as an investment in the future, by the way, because that's what invest in, uh, education is for the young people who are receiving education. But for all of us, we need a well-educated population if we want to succeed as a country. I mean, do you not feel that the government is just passing the buck on to the teachers, that, that they've given them all the responsibility? Yes, they're giving them money, but they are essentially saying, you know, any, any more problems, you're going to be the ones that cop it. Well, this is, this is why we need a, a national programme. This is a start, but it's nowhere near enough what the government's announced here. You've got to pay catch-up with young people. A generation of young people have lost out on a year 
uh, of education now. You can't catch up on that just with some summer schools over this summer. This has to go on for much longer than that. And the amount of funding that the government's come forward with, it's the equivalent of one new trainee teacher over a whole year for a secondary school. That won't be enough. It's a start, but we really need the government to, to look at this situation, talk to parents and families uh, and children, but also the education profession, to look at how we really do step up to the mark as a country, because what the government's announced so far won't do the, uh, the full job. Uh, on to high streets then. Um, they have really suffered during the pandemic, but, you know, they've been suffering for quite a while, haven't they? Uh, are, the, are the Labour Party a little bit late to the party here? Um, you know, are they, are they saveable, the high streets, quite frankly? Well, I, I don't think anyone wants us to write off our high streets right now. Now, high streets are going through uh, a, a situation they've never faced before. Many of our shops, businesses, hospitality um, spaces have been closed for the better part of a year now. They're really on, on their, their last legs financially. But we need to support our high streets to recover and to survive from this. Now, of course, there have been changes that have been underway for a long time, particularly the shift from bricks and mortar retail to online retail. But it's really speeded up over the last year. I think one third of shopping now has shifted from bricks and mortar to, to online. But we still don't have a level playing field between shops and, uh, and shopping on, on the internet. For instance, many of you know, the shops in my constituency tell me they can't compete on, on equal terms because they're having to pay a high level of business rates under normal times whereas the online retailers don't. So we've been calling for years now for the government to look at levelling the playing field on rates between online retailers and bricks and mortar shops in our high streets so that they can compete on more equal terms because none of us can afford to see or would want to see our high streets hollowed out and never recover. They're a vital why part then, of every community and we know, need to support them everywhere we can. Indeed, why then is the Labour Party not uh, supporting an increase in corporation tax? Keir Starmer yesterday in the Commons, now is not the time for tax rises on families and businesses. I mean, that would be a really simple way of taxing these big corporations who, as you say, have made an absolute killing during the pandemic. Well, I think Keir, Keir Starmer was absolutely right to say what he said. It's about timing this. No one's saying that Labour wouldn't look at the need to increase taxation isn't, isn't on... is the time now? You know, it's... We, someone's got to pay for this pandemic. The, the country has, has, has spent so much money. Wouldn't now be the time to tax the big corporations like Amazon who have made so much money out of it? There will come a time to do that. But the, the problem is, if you increase taxes right now on families and businesses, you run the risk of choking off the economic recovery. And that means losing jobs and people losing their incomes. And if you do that, you slow the economic recovery down. You can even throw it into reverse. We've just come through the worst recession of any major economy in this country, because over the last decade, this government has weakened the foundations of our economy. We can't afford to run risk risks with people's jobs at a time like this. Jobs and protecting people's jobs should be the focus of all of us right now in trying to help people get through this. And it's not just corporation tax, actually, the government's okay. looking at looking at. They're also putting up council tax on families okay. this April. It's the wrong thing to do. OK, we're going to have to leave it there. Steve Reid, thanks very much for joining us today on Sky. Thank you.